Whenever you come, when I come to a, a gathering that's dedicated to Christian giving, it's normal if you're asked to do the Bible exposition to talk about what's the Bible say about stewardship. Now, I've done this all, often over the years, but whenever I get to those passages on stewardship, I always notice that the, that the behavior is always rooted in something. So, for example, the classic one is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9. When you get to the end of 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, which is all about stewardship, all about giving, it says, and most English translations I don't think bring this out very well, it says your generosity should flow from your holding on to the gospel. And what does that mean? Does that simply mean the gospel is Jesus gave himself and so we try very hard to live like Jesus in, in our, in our uh, giving, we're trying to emulate Jesus. No, it's got to mean something more than that. It says if the gospel changes the heart in a deep and profound way, generosity, in a sense, is a result. Uh, the barriers that, that keep us from being generous are taken away. So if your gospel, if the gospel has really profoundly changed you, you just will be generous. So I thought that what I do this year is this morning and tomorrow morning, I want to actually go right to the root of things and say, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a gospel-changed heart? And we just assume it in so much of our ethical teaching. If you, if you really believe the gospel, if it's really changed your heart, then you'll do this and this and this. But what does that mean? Now, over the years, and as a pastor, I've seen plenty of people say, I've got to change. You know, it, it dawns on them for various reasons that, that they've got problems in their lives they haven't been facing up to and they've got to change. And I have seen literally thousands of people surrender, pray, give their lives, seek to change, and some do and some don't. Uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, saw great revivals in his town in Northampton, Massachusetts, and one of the things that puzzled him so much was that some people really got changed by the gospel and other people said they were or wanted to be or talked about it and went right back to being the way they used to be. He wrote four weighty books that are probably the best four books possible on this subject in which he was trying to come to grips with. What does it really mean, mean to be changed by the gospel? Not just try hard to live a good life, but changed by the gospel. Now, that's what I want to do. I would like to this morning, by looking at Romans 7, and tomorrow by looking at Romans 8, this morning mainly looking at what not to do in order to try to be changed by the gospel, and tomorrow uh, look mainly at what you can do and should do in order to be changed by the gospel. I want to get at the root of this. Now, I'm sorry that, in a sense, today, as I look at Romans 7, it's more of a negative. It's more like, here's how not to do it. I've been convinced as a pastor over the years that this is the most important thing, is to see what we all tend to do, and, and we just, we shouldn't be doing this. And that's what I want to talk to you. What is it? So here's how not to try to go about getting changed by the gospel, and tomorrow, how to. Uh, let me read you just two sections out of this long, famous passage, Romans 7. I'll read you something out of the middle and something at the very end. Paul says, so my brothers, you who died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to once, what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature, for I have desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not do, I do, I do not want to do, this is what I do and keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the evil living in me that does it. So I find this to be a principle. When I most want to do good, evil lies close at hand. 
For in my inner being I delight in the God's law, but I see another principle at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the principle of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what is our biggest problem? What we must stop trying to do about it and what will solve it. What's our biggest problem? What won't solve it and what will? Number one, Paul says right off the bat, there is huge evil living in him. Far more evil than anybody really, really believes. John Newton, the famous John Newton who wrote the Amazing Grace hymn, etc. There's one of his sermons, one of his letters in which he said, no one ever learned they were, being, they were a sinner by being told. You have to be shown. Nobody, now you're gonna say, boy, this, I haven't heard a Presbyterian minister really just go at me in a while, okay. <laughs> Paul says, you are far more evil you are far more wicked than you want to believe. You say you believe it, you don't believe it. You say you know it, of course you know it. I see what it says in the Bible, you have no idea how bad you are. There's evil living in you. There's a great place, by the way, in, in Luke 11, where Jesus is actually talking to his disciples about prayer, you know? Talking about prayer and, and, uh, and so forth. And at one point he says, <laughs> If you, he's talking to his apostles, you know, if you who are evil give good things to your children when they ask you, how much more will my heavenly father give me? Well, there's a drive-by. Wait a minute. <laughs> you who are evil, evil. He doesn't say, you know, to err is human, whoops. <laughs> Jesus so assumed that his apostles were thoroughly evil that he could just say, you know, you're evil, you know. He wasn't even talking, he just, it, it just so much in his mind, you're evil. And Paul says, because evil dwells in him, because evil dwells in us, we can't change. And a big part of the reason we can't change is that we don't deal with what's wrong with us as evil as such. We just don't realize it, we don't believe it. We say we believe it and we don't. The average Christian book that says how to overcome this, overcome that, just doesn't bring that up. It should be up there on page one. On page one, it should say, by the way, you can't do any of this. <laughs> the classic depiction of this is Robert Louis Stevenson's novella, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, you've seen so many versions, movies, plays, and things of it. You ought to just get it out. It's, it, just read it. It's about 80 pages long. It's a short, it's a long, it's a short, short novel, a long, short story. And it's a tremendous piece of literature. And of course, in it, it's all based on Romans 7. In it, you've got a guy named Dr. Jekyll. Now, Dr. Jekyll is a very good man, but he came to the conclusion that he had a dark side to himself that was holding him back and realizing and keeping him from real, doing all the things he wanted to do in the world. And at one point he says, quote, with every day I drew steadily nearer to that truth that man is not truly one, but two. I saw that of the two natures that contended in the field of my consciousness, even if I could rightly be said to be either, it was only because I was radically both. He says, I know I'm, I'm good, but I'm also radically evil. And he felt like the evil was pulling him back and keeping him from doing what he wanted to do. This is right out of Romans 7. So he came up with an idea, a potion. And the potion would separate out the evil and the good. So his evil side, his evil self, would coagulate, as it were, into a distinct personality. It would come out at night. But that meant during the day, Dr. Jekyll would be absolutely good and uh, freed from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gravitational pull of the evil and be free to live and work as he wanted to. In other words, he was going to, in a sense, you know, separate out the evil and focus it over here so his good side could really be good. And he felt like that'll work. But the minute he took the potion, he realized he had miscalculated. Because his evil side, his evil guy, 
was way more evil than he had thought. This is right out of Romans 7. And he says, the minute he becomes Edward Hyde, and this is a quote, I knew myself at the very first breath of this new life to be more wicked, tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil. And the thought at that moment braced and delighted me like wine. Edward Hyde was a being inherently malign. His every act and thought centered completely on the self. Now, you know, the word Hyde, the name Hyde, H-Y-D-E, is, uh, means hidden. This is what has been hidden, but it also means hideous. And when Dr. Jekyll comes to realize that his evil side is way more evil than he'd thought, and when that evil side begins to take over, begins to kill people, eventually he loses control, and in the end he commits suicide. And we'll get back to how that ends in a minute. But Robert Louis Stevenson understood you can't change. And one of the biggest reasons why we, we can't change is because we think we can. We have no idea how bad we are. We have no idea how evil we are. It's there. It's all there. It's all over the place. And what Robert Louis Stevenson and Paul are saying is the best of you, Dr. Jekyll's, St. Paul's, the very best of you don't even know how evil you are. It's all through there. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, Sufjan Stevens is a indie rock idol who's a Christian. And uh, one of his songs is called John Wayne Gacy, Jr. It's a song about a serial killer. It's a masterpiece. And, uh, you know, the village voice, who knows that uh, Sufjan is a Christian, uh, reviewed that piece, this is about three years ago or something like that, reviewed the John Wayne Gacy piece and knew immediately that this was a radical statement about the Christian doctrine of evil and human sin and admitted that, you know, the, the, uh, the critic admitted he didn't have the same view, but he said it was a masterpiece anyway because it was so well done. And it's basically about uh, a serial killer, John Wayne Gacy Jr., who had killed many, many young boys and stuffed their bodies under the floorboards of his uh, front porch. And he used to dress up as a clown, and he used to, uh, uh, you know, do kids' parties and things, and everybody thought he was very wonderful, but underneath, behind it all, he was killing people. And the song is a duet until the very last line. It's a duet, but at the very last line, suddenly Sufjan alone sings it. And the last words are, and in my best behavior, I am really just like him. Look beneath the floorboards for the secrets I have hid. He's saying that ultimately the difference between me and a serial killer is just that the serial killers had a chance for the evil in him to sprout. More watering, more fertilizer. But the seeds are in all of our hearts. The right situation, the right kind of self-centeredness, watering, you see, we're all self-centered and if we're all self-absorbed, that's what Edward Hyde says. He says, every single thought, that's, that's what made Edward Hyde what he was. Every thought centered totally on the self, utterly absorbed in himself, utterly thinking about, about himself. Oh, how do I look? How am I doing? How is everything working out for me? And those seeds are in every single one of us, and we could all be serial killers if the situation is right. We're all Edward Hyde. And so Sufjan's saying, hidden beneath the floorboards of all of our lives is horrible evil. And until we understand that, you're not going to make any, any, any kind of progress. Number one. So there's your problem. Radical evil and also not really seeing radical evil. But now, point two. At some point with most people, at some point it comes home to us that there's something wrong. Now, I'm talking to Christians, non-Christians. I mean, Christians get, grow up in a church, and they study the Bible, and they believe in, in that we're all sinful, and we're not good, and, and uh, you know, our hearts, you know that in your head, but as John Newton said, no one ever learned they were a sinner by learning it in Sunday school. No one ever learned they were a sinner by being told. No one ever learned they were a sinner by a sermon. So I guess you can all go home now, early. You've gotta be shown. You've gotta be shown. But at some point, it begins to come out, actually. At some point, 
the circ it's really very much, again, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Something comes into your life which is a potion. Some really hard to love person, a difficult marriage, a problem in business. Something comes, a temptation. And you begin to realize stuff starts sprouting and you say, wow, I better change. I've got to get on top of this. Now, point two. The second thing we learn from this passage is not just what our big problem is, but what will not solve our problem. This is my main point today. What will not solve our problem, but what 99.9999% of all people do to try to solve it. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson in, his, in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde shows it in an amazing way, but Paul comes right out. Basically, Paul says, what you do when you begin to realize how bad you are is you go to the moral law. That's what Romans 7 is all about. You go to the moral law. You say, I'm going to be really good. I'm going to work at it in a way I never have before. Now, most Christians, but people in the evangelical church, gussy that up with gospel talk. I'm going to give my life to Christ in a new way. I'm going to recommit in a new way. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to have my devotional. So I'm going to really, really surrender. I'm going to confess all known sin. I'm really going to walk by the Spirit. I'm going to do everything just right. Now, you know, Paul... When he says we turn to the law in order to deal with the problems in our heart, he's talking about the Mosaic Law. C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man has got a, uh, an appendix at the end, uh, which is a fascinating little uh, bit of work in which he shows that basically every religion in the world, including Christianity, uh, agree on what a moral life ought to be. You know, the, Generous to the poor, sexually faithful, devoted to God, honoring your parents, uh, you know, uh, tell the truth, do good and love honors, love your neighbor. It's, uh, the moral law is actually a fairly widely held consensus in the human race. So we turn to that moral law. There's an evangelical version of it, confess all known sin and walk in the spirit and really, really surrender to Christ. You know, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a Buddhist approach to it. There's, a, there's sort of a, you know, a secular approach to it. We all turn to the law, all to the law. But what's interesting is Paul says, and you might have caught it when I read by it, Paul says something absolutely fascinating. Trying to obey the law, trying to deal with your inner problems with the law makes them worse, always. Because he said, and this is an amazing statement, he says, we were controlled by the sinful nature and by the sinful passions aroused by the law that were at work in our bodies. So with that we bore fruit unto death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. This is an amazing statement. What Paul is saying is the law of God, or the Mosaic law, or the whatever, when you realize you've got to change, to simply apply the moral law through acts of the will to your heart has a greenhouse effect on your sinful passions. It doesn't just fail to deal with them, it makes them worse. It gets them worse. Now, how could that be? That's what we gotta spend a little bit of time, you know, exploring. Let me give you three examples. In his Confessions, St. Augustine talks about a time in his life when he was a young boy and he was stealing pears from a pear orchard. Later on, he had a chance to reflect on this. Why did I steal the pears from the pear orchard? Especially in light of two facts. One, I wasn't hungry. And two, I didn't like pears. <laughs> and he came to the conclusion the reason he stole the pears from the pear orchard was because he was told not to do it. There was something in his heart that basically looks out and says, nobody tells me how to live. And so that when the law came, it aroused that. I remember when I was a kid one time thinking, you know what, I never clean up my room. I was living with my parents, you know, I was a teenager. And my place is a pigsty. I've just got to get up and I've just got to clean it up today. So I, I remember I went into the bathroom to take a shower and on my way back, my mother, I was on my way back to clean up my room. My mother said, Tim, your room is a pigsty. Make sure you clean it up today. I just walked in another direction. I wasn't going to do it if she asked me to do it. Why would I do it? The law aroused the sinful passions. It made it worse, but let me keep on going. You know, Paul gives a biographical sketch in which he says, early up in chapter 7, 
He says, I was alive apart from the law, but when the command, thou shalt not covet, came home, it slew me and I died. Now, I admit people have been struggling with this. What does that mean? For many, many years they've been struggling. What does he mean? But here's what I think he's mean, he means after thinking about it for quite a long time. When Paul looked at all the other Ten Commandments, he felt pretty good. You know, don't kill. I haven't killed. Don't commit adultery. I'm not committing adultery. Don't worship false gods. I only go to the temple. I only go to the synagogue. I only go, you know, and worship the true God. But when he got to the last commandment, thou shalt not covet, he was forced to see something because the, that, the last co uh, commandment is the only commandment that has to do with the motions of the heart, not the behavior, the motivation. And basically it was a commandment that said, love God so much that you're always content with what you have. And that made him look into his heart and it slew him. And here's the reason why. Think, if the essence of sin is self-centeredness, right, self-absorption, if that's what's ruining the environment, if that's what's ruining, uh, if that's what's dividing the races and the nations, leads to war, if that's what is destroying your relationships, self-centeredness, everything has to revolve around me. If this is the problem, he began to realize that the reason he was obeying the law was only to make God have to bless him, to say, I'm a great person because I obey the law. God has to bless me because I obey the law. And what that was doing was aggravating the same the problem. It wasn't making it better. It was making it worse. If you basically obey the law in order to say, I'm a good person. I have overcome my problems. God now blesses me. People need to respect me. First of all, that makes you more self-righteous. Secondly, that makes you more anxious because you never are quite sure whether you're being good enough. And then, th which is more self-absorption. And then thirdly, it makes you angry. You know why? Because whenever anything goes wrong in your life, you feel like, I'm a good person. I work so, work so hard to be good. Why is my life going worse than that person over there who's not even trying? So anger comes from trying real hard to obey the law. And, uh, and, and anxiety comes and self-righteousness comes. In other words, the self-centeredness that the law is supposed to be dous dousing, it's really just oil on the fire. Robert Louis Stevenson gets at this in an amazing way. And this is, a part, this is a part of the story that you probably never have heard unless you've read the book recently because it never seems, to, as far as I know, to come out in any of, the, of the, uh, you know, the plays and the movies. But he decided that the way he was going to deal with Edward Hyde was he was going to, he was going to douse him with Dr. Jekyll. And he put it like this. He says, I resolved in my future conduct to redeem the past. When he began to realize that Edward Hyde was hurting people, killing people, what am I going to do? He decided he was going to clamp down on Edward Hyde. Here's what he said. I resolved in my future conduct to redeem the past, and I can say with honesty that my resolve was fruitful of some good. You know how earnestly in the last months of the last year I labored to relieve suffering. You know how much I did for other people. It was a fine, clear January day. I felt I had gotten on top of Edward Hyde. And I sat in a park, smiling, and comparing myself with other men, comparing my act of goodwill with the lazy cruelty of their neglect. And at that very moment of that vainglorious thought, a qualm came over me, a hard nausea and the most deadly shuddering. I was once more Edward Hyde. And it was the very first time he'd ever become Edward Hyde without the potion. Why? Robert Louis Stevenson suddenly realized something, I think, and he puts it in here. Dr. Jekyll says, I'm going to, I'm going to clamp down on Edward Hyde with, with, my, with my goodness. I'm going to be so good as Dr. Jekyll, Edward Hyde won't be able to show up. But the self-absorption and the pride and the vainglory that comes from being incredibly good is just another way to make you self-centered. Another way to make the world miserable with another kind of self-centered person. In other words, there's two ways to be your own savior and Lord. Two ways to be your own savior instead of letting God be a savior. One is by going out and just living any way you want, being very, very bad. The other is by being incredibly good, being incredibly moral, being incredibly surrendered, being incredibly generous, so that you can say, God's got to bless me. He's got to answer my prayers. People have to respect me. Look what I'm doing. It's a different kind of self-centeredness. 
It's self-righteousness, it's Phariseeism, but there's anger, there's suppressed anger, there's anxiety, there's prejudice, there's bigotry, there's condescension. But, it, but in other words, Robert Louis Stevenson had the, had the narrative brilliance to realize that when Dr. Jekyll said, I'm gonna get rid of Edward Hyde, I'm not gonna give him that nasty potion, I'm gonna be really incredibly good, it was just another way down to Edward Hyde, is by being incredibly good. There's two ways, in, order, in other words, to be a, your own savior and lord. One is by being incredibly bad, one is by being incredibly good, and they both get you to the same place. And everybody is trying to do what Paul says can't be done. Every secular person, through willpower, most Christians, by just trying really incredibly hard to be totally surrendered, are trying to do what he said he can't, can't be done. Jonathan Edwards wrote a book, a masterpiece, called The Nature of True Virtue. And uh, this masterpiece is a very hard book to read. If you say, I'm gonna read it, to, you know, I'm gonna get it on Amazon.com and I'll get it home. Tim Keller said to read it and I'll read it. It's a, it's a, it's a very hard book to read. It's a philosophical treatise. It was, uh, but here's what he basically said. He says, you know, there's two ways to do something. You know, you can do something as a means to an end or an end in itself. Um, when I was in college, I had, a, I had to take a music appreciation course and I had to listen to Mozart as part of the music appreciation course. So why was I listening to Mozart? I listened to Mozart in order to get a good grade, in order to get a degree, in order to get a good job, in order to make money. In, order, in other words, I listened to Mozart in order to make money. But today I'll spend a whole lot of money in order to listen to Mozart. <laughs> Why? Because Mozart has changed. He's become a means to an end. I do it not because I want people to think I'm cultured, not in order to get a grade. I just like it. It's a means to an end. It's satisfying in and of itself. It's a great thing in and of itself. Now, Jonathan Edwards says there's two ways to obey the law of God. In one, you're doing it for your sake. You're doing it to get self-respect. You're doing it so that you can look yourself in the mirror. You're doing it so that people will respect you. You're doing it so God will, will, will favor you, so God will take you to heaven, so God will hear your prayers. In other words, you're doing it for your sake. The other approach is to do it for God's sake, just to please him, just because he is a good in and of himself. See? In one, you're doing it for your sake because you're trying to get things for God, from, from God. You want to get things from God, health and favor and self-respect. But in the second way, Edward says, you're doing it just to get God, not to get things from God, just to get him, just to please him, just to resemble him, just to say thank you. One he called common morality, the other he called true virtue. In common morality, what you're actually doing is you are uh, uh, using God and using your morality in order to get to kind of control your life. So now God can't just do anything. You're, you've, you're a pretty good person. He's got to treat you well. And in true virtue, you do it just for the joy of it, just for the goodness of it, just for the greatness of knowing God, just for the greatness of resembling God. Now he says, the vast majority of people who are doing the right thing in this world are doing it out of fear and pride. I don't tell a lie, why? Because I'm afraid of getting caught and because I like to think of myself as the kind of person that doesn't tell lies. That's fear and pride. It's not the same thing as doing it just for the joy of the integrity, of walking in integrity before God. Now, Jonathan Edwards says, good. I'm glad people are out there not telling lies because of common morality, because of fear and pride. Think of what a nasty world it would be if the only people who told the truth were people that had such joy in God and had such a relationship to God that they knew their salvation was by sheer grace alone. They weren't trying to get anything from him with their obedience. Nevertheless, at the very heart of your moral life, for most people, you are actually nurturing evil. You're actually being good and being generous and being truthful out of fear and pride, out of self-centeredness. And so you're nurturing the self-centeredness, which is the very essence of evil. Now here's what goes on. You may have been raised all your life to tell the truth out of fear and pride. You may have been raised all your life to do this and do that and be generous out of fear and pride, but at some point, something will come into your life, some kind of stress, something bad will happen, and you'll find yourself lying or embezzling. And you'll say, I don't understand. 
I wasn't raised like that. And Jonathan Edwards' answer is, yes, you were. You just didn't know you were. Of course you were. Absolutely you were. Unless you understand the gospel of sheer grace, unless your relationship with God is based on absolute grace, if you go to God and say, I'm going to obey the moral law in order to overcome everything, in order to get God to do things for me, all you're doing is you're enhancing your self-centeredness and you're nurturing self-centeredness and pride in the center of your moral life and you're actually making yourself worse through all of your efforts and all of your discipline and all, your, and all of your programs. Worse. And you haven't really changed the heart, you've just restrained the heart. You've jury-rigged it. Let me give you an illustration and I've got to give you my last point because it's mainly looking to tomorrow. Once upon a time, by the way, I got, this, I got this illustration from Charles Spurgeon, but I can't find it. I have no idea where he said it, but I'm almost sure I read it 30 years ago in a Spurgeon sermon. Uh, there was once a gardener who, gave, who grew an enormous carrot, and he took it to his king and said, My lord, this is the greatest carrot I have ever grown or ever will grow. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. The king was touched and discerned the man's heart. And as the man returned to go, the king said, wait, you are clearly a good steward of the earth and a good subject of mine. I have a, lot of, I have a plot of land right next to yours. I want to give it to you freely as a gift so you can garden it. The gardener was amazed and delighted with the gift and went home rejoicing. Now there was a nobleman at the king's court who overheard this and he thought to himself, hmm, if you get five acres for a carrot, So the next day, the nobleman came before the king with a handsome black stallion. And he said, my lord, I breed horses, and this is the greatest horse I've ever bred or ever will breed. I want to give it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. The king immediately discerned his heart, however. So he just took it and dismissed the nobleman and said, thank you, and began to walk away with the horse. The nobleman, however, was deeply perplexed as are we. And as the king walked away, he called to him and said, but your majesty, I don't understand. And the king turned around and said, I know your perplexity. Listen, the gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. And I remember Spurgeon said, unless you understand the gospel of radical grace, that you are absolutely helpless, that you're absolutely lost, that you deserve to go to hell, and you should have no complaints. But by, the, by infinite cost of his son, and through sheer grace, God has saved you. And now your obedience has to be completely framed by that. It, nothing but an act of aesthetic joy. Res why do I like Mozart? Because I just love Mozart. Why? It's just beautiful. You see, it's not useful, it's beautiful. Why do I want to please God? Because he's beautiful. What he did was beautiful. And when that begins to well up in your heart and you start to try to live a good life, on the basis of that, then and only then do you begin to change. Otherwise, you're being generous, but you're giving your money to yourself. You're feeding the hungry, but you're feeding yourself. You're clothing the naked, but you're clothing yourself. Here's what's really gonna solve our problem. This is, this is a conclusion. This is just something in, in Romans 7, looking forward to Romans, Romans 8. Did you notice a very strange statement that Paul said in the very beginning about the fact that we have died to the law to be married to another? Let me tell you what this is about. One of the things that's so hard, this is another sermon on marriage, one of the things that's so hard about marriage is that when you get married, after a while you begin to realize that your, your, your spouse holds your self-image in his or her hand. It's, for, it's very complicated. But you know, if everybody else in the world is telling you you're great and your spouse is telling you you are absolutely the worst person in the world, it's hard not to feel like the worst person in the world. And if everybody else in the world is criticizing you but your spouse says, honey, you are great. You know, you can tell the world to jump. Because, because your, your spouse has this massive ability to really program your self-appreciation, what you think of yourself. Now, Paul actually says, is the law sin? No. Should we obey the law? Of course. We have to obey the law. We ought to obey the law with all our might. But we can't be married to the law, he says. 
You can't look at the law as your spouse. You can't look at the law and say, if I can satisfy you, then I know I'm a pretty good person. You've got to be married to Jesus. Well, remember what Paul says, and this is a weird metaphor. He says, you've been married to the law, but now you've got to be married to Jesus. Well, how does that happen? How can, if you're married to somebody and you want to get married to somebody else, what can get you there? Not too many things, but one of the things is death. Except in this case, it's Jesus' death. At the very, very end of the book of, uh, of the novel of Jekyll and Hyde, at the very end, it's very horrible. Because the last time Jekyll becomes Hyde, he can't turn back. And he knows he's Edward Hyde permanently. And Hyde is the person who's been doing the murders, right? And therefore, the police are after Hyde. And the reason they can never find Hyde is Hyde becomes Jekyll. But when Dr. Jekyll becomes Mr. Hyde for the last time, and Edward Hyde knows he can't hide, Hyde can't hide. He can't hide his hideousness. He can't hide his horror. He can't hide his wickedness. And the police are knocking on the door. He kills himself. But what's interesting is the Bible says over and over again that when Jesus Christ came to earth, they were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond any human likeness. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we're healed. Look. When the police came for the hideous one, they got Jesus, not you. Jesus took upon himself our hideousness. It's what we deserve to be taken away. He came into our place. He was beautiful. He became hideous. He was perfect. He became he took, he took the place of the sinner. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And you know what's weird? Only when you are melted by the beauty of that. That's your Mozart. When you're melted by the beauty of that, to see what he did for you. That is what will turn you into a true generous giver. Because in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul does not say, Get generous because you better because, doggone it, look at those people out there. They're so poor and you're so rich. That's not what he says. He says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. And through his disfigurement and hideousness you might become beautiful in the eyes of God. That gets rid of the worry that keeps you from being a generous person. It gets rid of the real thing that keeps you from being a generous person. The worry. I'm afraid. I want to be able to wear these clothes. I want to be able to go these places. Your problems with self-esteem, your problems with worry, all the things that keep you from being generous, the gospel destroys with the beauty of what he's done and the affirmation of who you are in him. That is what changes the heart. Now, does that mean there's nothing we can do? We can just sort of listen to sermons and get inspired at the very end and go home and somehow that'll make us better? No, there's some stuff you can do. But you have to take the gospel deeper into the heart, not just try harder to be a good person. And we'll look at that tomorrow. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the fact that Jesus Christ, though he was beautiful, became hideous so that we, who are hideous in your sight, are now beautiful. And our sins are covered and everything is, uh, is ours by grace. And we know, Lord, that there is a, a way for us to change that takes that gospel into our hearts in a disciplined way. And we pray that you would help us understand that so that we can not actually make ourselves worse by our good deeds. And we pray that you would help us understand that better because we spent this time together today and tomorrow. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.